Patty and I spent some of our time in our, one of our favorite places on the beach, but I sure do. I wouldn't want to be there all the time. I need to be involved in people's lives. I miss you all. We miss you when we're not here. If you would, I would like for you all to pray with me. I thank you, Father, that we have a group of friends here. More than friends, we are brothers and sisters. We belong to you. And we are knit together. Our hearts are knit together. We were baptized into the family of Christ when we trusted alone in Christ. There is a bond here that is nowhere else in the world. It's between Christians. Wherever we get together with Christians, there is a bond. We have that here. And Lord, we express that here through joy and through love. Father, we are greatly concerned at what we see in our country. And Father, we ask that you would work mightily here. Now, Lord, we understand that we have kicked, uh, we have kicked you out of the courtroom. We've kicked you out of the classroom. We've even kicked you out of some churches. Lord, we don't deserve uh, your mercy. We deserve your judgment, but we beg you for mercy on behalf of the faithful. We beg you that you would withhold judging this country. And Father, if we might be so bold, we would ask for your grace too, that you would give us what we do not deserve, a revival. I ask that you would move through the churches and through the streets of America and bring revival to this country once again where there's respect for authority, where there's honor for one another, where there's thankfulness, where families are strong. Lord, we need you desperately. Father, we ask that you would answer these prayers. And I ask that you would also give me clarity right now. May the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths be pleasing to you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In speaking of the long wait to see who wins the election, one person quipped, I feel like we're all children in divorce court to see who gets custody of us. There's some imagery there that I think is pretty true. Another person quipped, this is the election that 2020 deserves. Think of it, COVID-19, the rioting. Think of all the things that have happened this year, the recessions from COVID-19 that 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 has created. It just seems apropos to end the year with an election like this. While Mr. Biden has declared victory, President Trump has called foul. The media and Mr. Biden have declared that he is the victor, and yet the officials have not announced that yet while they still count. But those things, while they might be upsetting to us, and we all have maybe different folks that we want to see in the White House, But there are things that are happening that I think are even more concerning, and that is, I wonder who really is in control here. President Trump isn't powerful enough to do all this, and nor is Mr. Biden. What is happening here? You hear of ballot fraud uh, out there. It seems to be rather prominent. Um, They're proving it. Who is doing all this? Who is controlling all of this? Uh, you were hearing of uh, ballots that were intentionally stowed away, ballots that came in after the election was done, stuffing ballot boxes. My personal unfavorite is the ballots of dead people, the people who were dead before the election, people who were dead before they could register. They didn't register or vote because they were dead, and yet there's reports of them voting. Who's in control here? 
Is it we've heard it before with China and Russia? Are they interfering? Is it somebody else? Are there powers that we don't know about? And you know, I'm asking those questions. I don't have an answer for it for you, nor do you. That's way above our pay grade. We're just never not going to know. Well, maybe we will, but I doubt it. And so while I started on my way towards a new series this Sunday, Monday that got interrupted in my prayer time, and God said, I want you to teach them about me again. I want you to remind them all of who I am. We ask who's in control, and God says, I am and no other. I'm in control over all things. And so it's God, and you would expect for me to say that because I'm a pastor. But this morning, we're going to talk about the sovereignty of God. We're going to define it, and then we're going to look at what it looks like. Because I can give you exegesis on what sovereignty is and define it and give you some fancy theological terms, and you'd get it. But I don't know about you, but it helps me when I see it. I need to see things, and then I helped under, it helps me to understand it. So if you would, I would like for you to open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus, second book in the Bible, Exodus chapter 13. We're going to begin in verse 17. And we will, again, once we'll look at the uh, divine sovereignty, we'll define it, and then we'll look at what it looks like. And so... In Exodus 13, we're going to read about the most famous story in the Old Testament where God rescued, freed, liberated Israel from a hopeless and helpless situation. And I remind you, that same God still works today, for he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, first thing I want to talk about here is sovereignty, big word. We don't use it a whole lot, but let me give you three things that sovereignty gives to God. One, he has the authority to make his own choices. He has authority, ultimate authority. There is no authority above him. But not only the authority, he has the power to carry it out. He's omnipotent. He has all power. So nothing can stand in his way. What he has uh, the, what he deems necessary he can do. And then the third thing is he has the freedom to do whatever he wishes. And so when we talk about sovereignty in basic terms, God has the authority, the power to do whatever he wants, and the freedom to carry it out. Let me give you what one man, the most powerful man on earth, said about God's sovereignty. And I quote, All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? That is recorded in Daniel 4.35. And it was quoted by Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on earth at that time. And so we've said this in the past, and I remind you again, if we wanted just a kind of short and sassy definition of God's sovereignty, he is large and in charge. Large and in charge. I don't know about you, but I can remember that. I got it in my notes anyway, but I figured I'd... Now, fortunately for us, God does not express his sovereignty ultimately in judgment which is for his prerogative to do that. He demonstrates it in salvation. We wonder, why does God save some people? And the real question is, why does he save anyone at all? For we're all sinners, right? Listen to what Paul wrote. In him, we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. If you have trusted alone in Christ alone, it was not just your decision. He chose you. And so when you reach heaven, Jesus isn't going to look at you and say, what in the world? How'd you get in here? Did you sneak in the back door? 
Do you ever feel like he might say that to you? I have. But you're chosen. You're wanted. And he makes us righteous. He declares us righteous now, and one day we'll be completely righteous when we reach heaven. And so God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. He is large and he's in charge. But what does that look like? How does it play out? And I think the best picture for this is in this story. Now, in this story, you understand that Pharaoh is king in Egypt. And what you may or may not realize is that he was more than king. He was a despot, which means he could do anything he wanted to. But more than that, Pharaoh believed he was a god. And so did the people. And so he could do anything. Uh, Think of his response when Moses first stood before him and Moses talked about Yahweh, the Lord. uh, Here is Pharaoh's response. Who is this Lord that I should obey him? Who is he? So I picture Pharaoh sitting there going, pfft. Who's this guy? Who's this Lord? He was about to find out, wasn't he? He made a big mistake. What ensued was a battle. I picture uh, something like a 10-round boxing match where each plague presented one of Egypt's gods. And God, the Lord, the only true God, scored a knockout punch in every round. And when they got to the 10th round, the score was God 10, Pharaoh zero. You know that, right? God clearly demonstrated to Pharaoh, all of Egypt and to Israel, that he is large and in charge. One at a time, he had knocked out their belief in their gods because he's the God who controls all things. Well, finally, what happens is Pharaoh, while he's holding his dead son in his arms, says, okay, let him go. He finally succumbs to Moses' command given through God to let my people go, and they head on their way out. That brings us to chapter 13, verse 17. Read with me, if you will. Now, when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. You know, it's frustrating when God leads us around the long way. Have there been things in your life where you've been waiting on God to do something? It's something you're convinced he wants to do. Maybe it's somebody you've been praying for to come to Christ. You know that's his will. And maybe it's a healing that you have told God, you heal me and I'll do this for you because I want to serve you. Maybe it's a job. And maybe it's one of your kids and they're waiting for a spouse and they've been waiting. And you know that's right for them but God seems to take the long way around. And that's what he's doing here. He knows what we're ready for, when we're ready for it. Look at verse 18. This is important. Hence, God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. Don't miss that. God is leading them, and he is leading them into a huge problem. God is leading them into a trap. He's leading them into a cul-de-sac. And you all know what a cul-de-sac is. Patty and I live on a cul-de-sac. There's one way in and one way out. And God leads them out into a cul-de-sac. And so basically they have the Red Sea on one side, and the only way out is going to be filled by Pharaoh and his, and his soldiers. We don't think God works like that. We think if I'm following God, everything's going to be smooth and rosy. Sometimes he leads us into difficulties because he wants to hurt you, 
No. He will bring you into a situation to where you will become hopeless and helpless on your own. And then he steps in and he shows you his love and his power as he lifts you up out of it. Now you're living in truth when you understand that it's God who empowers you, who loves you, who will rescue you, and yes, he even knows you, and he's aware of you. Don't miss that. It wasn't it Jesus who sent the disciples off? I'm gonna go up on a hill and pray, and you all just go out. Did he not know there was gonna be a storm that night that he was gonna have to come out to them walking on the water? Of course he knew that. He intentionally sent them out. And then he came out walking on the storm of their life. Brothers and sisters, he'll do that for you. Don't forget that because that's who he is. You see, I am reminded that the God that we have may be wrapping even our country into a conundrum right now and putting us up against the wall to where we just don't see a way out. Now, I don't know this, and I'm not saying I do know this, but I am saying that I know my God can do anything because he is the God who continually takes the difficult and does the impossible with it. (laughs) Isn't that great? We can muddle around in a normal world, but if you want a miracle, you're going to have to call up on God. And so he is the God who continually takes the difficult and does the impossible with it because that's who he is. And so God is going to lead them right into a conundrum, into a cul-de-sac, into a problem, into a place where they will be in between a rock in a hard place, cornered up a tree, up the creek without a paddle. But he's leading them the long way, which reminds me that many times in life we want to get to a certain point and God is saying, don't you understand? It's more about the journey than it is the destination. It's the things you learn along the journey. We're always in such a rush to get every place Especially as we were kids, you know, when you're 10, your biggest wish was to be 12 or 13 or 14 like the older kids. It's about the journey. It's still about the journey. Look at verse or chapter 14, verse 1. Oh, one more thing here. Look at verse 22. No, 21. 13. Chapter 13, verse 21. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light. They might travel by day and by night. God is providing the direction. And with God's direction comes protection. The cloud by day would protect them from the hot sun. The fire by night gave them light but it also gave them heat. And when you walk with God, he gives direction and he gives protection. There's one way that Charles Stanley says in one of his life principles is obey God. Pretty simple. It's told to him by his grandfather. His grandfather told him the number one thing you're gonna do if you're gonna go into ministry, Sonny, is you obey God. Obey God. And he said, if God tells you to put your head down and put it through a brick wall, you start running. When you get there, God will open up the hole because when you obey God, he pays the consequences, not you. And so God's direction, when we follow him, it comes with his protection. And we see that in the pillar of fire and in the cloud. Now, Chapter 14, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before some big word. Between Migdal and the sea and you shall camp in front of Baal Zephon opposite the sea. He's setting it all up here. Who's in control here? For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, ah, they're out there, they're lost. They're wandering aimlessly. The wilderness has shut them in. That's the cul-de-sac. And Pharaoh knows it. And Pharaoh's, we're going after him. 
We're going to go after him. Thus, the Lord says to Moses, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so, just as he said. I want you to remember here, they are in the center of God's will. We tend to think if you're in the center of God's will, nothing bad's going to happen, but it will. But if you're in the center of God's will, he pays the consequences because you're obeying him, right? To make matters worse, not only is God sending them into a cul-de-sac where they're going to be trapped, he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And so Pharaoh has hardened his own heart. He's beyond help now. And so when God hardens his heart, his anger is going to rage, to wrath, to fury. A man's literally out of his mind. He has one ambition now, and that's hunt down those Hebrews and kill them. Nothing's going to stop them. And so if we were in this and we heard this story, it'd be, thank you very much, God. Here you're firing Pharaoh up, and you're trapping us. This is not looking good. In verses 5 through 9, we have a pretty gloomy picture. Look at verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled Pharaoh and his servants, well, they did exactly what God said. And he takes, dropping down to verse 7, he took 600 select chariots. We are talking about the most powerful man on earth is Pharaoh, and the superpower of the world is Egypt, and the premier army of the world is the Egyptian army. And you have a bunch of slaves out there trying to get away with sticks, right? They are no match for them. No match at all. It would be almost like bringing down the wrath of the federal government here and the armies on Florida. What chance would we stand against the army, the navy, and all the armed forces? It's the same situation. So Pharaoh is the most powerful man. God has hardened his heart. Have you ever seen someone lose it? Somebody that gets so mad, they say things they shouldn't be saying. They make accusations they shouldn't say. They say things they know are wrong. And they do things that are very destructive to them and to others around them. That's where Pharaoh is now. But he has that one ambition. They are in a no-win situation. And when you're in a no-win situation and you're in the will of God, look for God to show up. Look for God to show up. He must be in his will, though, because he's going to show you who he is in a whole new way, because he wants to, he wants to be known. Drop down to verse 10. The camera shifts in this story, and now it shifts to the Israelites as they're trekking out. They don't know that they're lost. But they look off, and what do they see? This huge dust cloud. What is that dust cloud? Pharaoh and his army, and they're coming after him. Look at verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And, of course, they were great spiritual people, and so they didn't get worried at all. They just said, well, God's got this. I'm okay with that. It's cool. Doesn't say that, does it? Doesn't say that at all. They became very frightened. They're scared to death because they're going to die. They know where they are, so now they have a choice. You can drown or you can be slaughtered. Which one would you like? And so what do they do? They cry out to God. Oh, Lord, our God, we know that you are most powerful and you can do anything you want. That's not crying out to God. That's praying. They cried out to God. Probably it was a one-word prayer. Help! Help! Right? Don't we do that when we get in the middle of something? Then Moses stands up. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Can you feel the sarcasm? 
Why have you dealt with us this way, bringing us out of Egypt? What's wrong with you, Moses? Isn't he the guy that's been rescuing them and they were all hallelujah and everything else marching out of Egypt? Now they turn back on that guy. What is wrong with you? And we praise God and we complain about man. And that's what they're doing. We do that today. Verse 12. It's not the word that we spoke to in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. This is the first time Moses is hearing that. We loved being slaves. It was great. They were praying every day to get out of there. All of a sudden, everything's changing. Therefore, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Hopeless, helpless. They've given up. Cry out to God, complain about man. What's wrong with you, Moses? Probably a few of them had bumper stickers. Moses is a moron. They're terrified. But you know what? The very person they're blaming is the only person that has a godly perspective. He's the only one. When we're in a jam and something that we don't understand, we need someone in our lives that understands how God works Someone who can see your situation through a godly perspective. Someone who demonstrates wisdom and discernment and walks with God. If not, we're only pulling ignorance. You need someone that can see life from God's perspective. You'll find it refreshing. Moses was in touch with God. Look at verse 15. No, I didn't want verse 15. I want verse uh, 13. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again. And so Moses makes this great speech. Just stand still. God will rescue you. He is the great way maker, right? Look at verse 15. This is not recorded. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? So what's going on here? Here's what I think is going on. Moses is saying, God will rescue us. You stand and you watch what he does. God, you better do something fast. It's good. Look at him coming over there. We're going to die. Even leaders like Moses, they can't deny what they see, but they force aside the fear to walk in faith. And that's what you see Moses in the midst of fear and faith, overcoming his fear with faith. Verse 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. Now there's two miracles here. I want you to realize that one is parting the sea, but the other is dry land. I think when we ask God for uh, for miracles, he's complete. He didn't even let him get muddy. He gave him dry ground to walk on. They didn't have to get stuck in the mud. He gave him dry ground to make that crossing easy because when God makes a way, he makes a way. I don't want you to miss this. Faith is God's economy. You want to please God, it's going to take faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. What is faith? Hebrews 11, 1. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We get confused. And if you hear nothing else in this message, hear these things. Faith is not found in your feelings. You can feel you have all the faith in the world, but you ain't moving. You're afraid to move. You're afraid to do what God has asked you to do. 
Faith is not the absence of fear. You can have faith and be very fearful, but faith overcomes that fear. You see, because faith frequently operates in the presence of fear. So don't beat yourself. If you're in a situation where you're afraid and you're, you're struggling to have faith, don't beat yourself. We're all there at different times. And remember this. Faith is found, not in your feelings. Faith is found in your feet. Faith is found in your feet. Get moving. That's what God tells them to do. Get moving. You see, the truth is, we are waiting on God for something. And God's waiting on you. When God sees your faith, when God sees my faith, we see God. That's when he shows up. That's where I wanted you. You are acting in faith. You are honoring, honoring me with your faith. Now I'm going to step in. And that's what happens with Moses. Y'all got to get walking. That's faith. Moses, you're going to have to raise up that stick and part the sea. How many of you have sticks that part the sea? Anybody here? I'd like to talk to you about that. We can't even part our hair with a stick, right? You see, it's faith. And so God said, you need to go out there and do that first. And when God saw faith, they saw God. When God saw faith, he acted and the miracle happened. You see, it's true. God guides a moving target, not a sitting target. We all know people that say, well, let's pray about it. Let's pray about it. Let's pray about it. That's great. But there reaches a point where that just, let's just pray about it, becomes spiritual talk. God requires faith. He requires action. And when he says sit, you sit. And when he says move, you move. This is how he works. And some of us don't see those miracles because we're not willing to trust God enough. All of us. I want you to realize there's almost 2 million people in Moses' party. This is no small amount of people. And God parts the water. So how far apart was it? Was it like this little narrow alley that they had to go through? They never would have gotten through that in a night. The scholars estimate that that path was probably somewhere between a half a mile wide and a mile wide for them to get across. This is no small miracle. God is delivering them in big style, and he dried the ground for them. So just who's in charge here? Who's calling the shots? Pharaoh thinks he's calling the shots. Moses knows he's not calling the shots. Some of the people think Moses is calling the shots, but they're going to learn it's God. And the same God today is calling the shots for your life, for mine, for this country, in all areas. He's large and in charge. Don't forget that. This is one of my favorite parts of this. Go down to verse 19. God tells them to move across, and what does he do? When he sees their faith, he parts the water, and then what does he do? Well, you got Pharaoh coming on chariots and horses. They're coming a whole lot faster than these people are walking. Somebody needs to get on this, right? So what does God do? He moves to be their rear guard, and he goes behind them. The angel of God, verse 19, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. And you're thinking, it's a big deal. So verse 20, it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was a cloud along with the darkness. Yet it gave light at night, thus the one did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, so the waters were divided. In verse 22, the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. What I want you to see here is that God was their rear guard and he gave them light through the pillar of cloud. But he was creating all kinds of chaos back here for the Egyptians. 
I commend to you to read Psalm 77, 14 through 20 at a later time. That gives us a better depiction of what actually was going on. Thunderstorms, earth shaking, God was stirring everything up. So what I see here and why I think this is necessary and why I love this part, God can curse and bless at the same time. He can curse one group of people who are not following him, but in their midst, in the same geographical area, at the very same time, he can curse them and bless them. I won't read all of it. I think this is written by Moses. Some scholars think that he did write this. We're not sure. But Psalm 91 A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. It's for those who are faithful in God. He can protect you, even in the midst. So I don't know what's going to happen in our country. I don't know if things will get better or they'll get worse. I don't know. I don't even know who's going to be our president. But if things do get bad, this is what I'm counting on. This is the only place I've found peace because I don't understand what's happening in our country. I don't like the way things are digressing and spiraling down, but I do know who holds tomorrow, and it's more than just a cute saying. They crossed over on dry land. God gave them a lavish blessing by giving them that dry ground. One of the things I'm reminded of here is when God blesses, he adds no trouble to it. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes we are waiting for the other shoe to drop. But listen to what Proverbs 10.22 says. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. He can bless you with wealth of life and health, money, and he adds no trouble to it when he blesses you with it. I want you to see the completeness of God here. Now picture this with me. The Israelites are coming across... And now Pharaoh has figured his way through there, and now they're down, and they're crossing. Now, that's rather, that's insane that Pharaoh would go in between those waters. Didn't he just lose 10 rounds with God? Didn't he just lose his son? And yet, he's so angry, he cannot think straight, and they go right in there. Now, this is a problem for the Israelites, because if you think about it, this is just an escape for today. If Pharaoh's smart, he's going to go around. He'll catch up to them. But they don't know that, and they don't know what God's going to do. So they get across, and it's like, oh, there they are right there. And I picture it this way. I don't know if this is accurate or not, but they can see the whites of their eyes as they're coming across. And there's the Israelites all on the shoreline saying, so we're going to die here today. And just at that point, God says, Moses, raise that staff again. And there was a huge burial at sea. All of Pharaoh's men died that day. All of them. Not one lived. That's what the Bible says. God is complete when he blesses. They were not going to have any more trouble from them. Dead men don't give them any trouble. And if they had any doubts, they were seeing the bodies washing up on the shore. God killed them all. You see, it's God's glory. God is in control. The God who parted the Red Sea can make a way for you and me. Do you understand that? I want you to come away with that today. These are not just fun little stories that we look to. Jesus did not promise to make your life easy. Listen to his words. I leave, in peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. On that same night, his last night on earth, before the cross, he said, I have told you these things so that in me you have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. But if you've not come to a point in your life where you've trusted Christ, this means nothing to you because he's not going to rescue you, probably, because you're not his. And he's not made these promises to you. And so if you have not, today would be a wonderful day for you to go to God. It's a simple prayer, 
but it's the change of heart that makes the difference. It's going to God and saying, God, I recognize that you say we're all sinners. We've all done wrong. We're all dysfunctional. We've all made mistakes. God calls that a sin. He calls it missing the mark. We tend to add a lot of baggage on that in churches. Oh, they're such a sinner. Sin just means you missed the mark. What was the mark? Perfection. Huh, well, we're all there. That's why the Bible says for all have sinned. All have sinned. Everybody sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what did God do? The plan all along before he formed the earth was to send Jesus. And he sent Jesus to rescue us. Jesus did more than part the sea in this one. He parted heaven and earth, and he made a way. He made a path for you straight to heaven. If you will only trust in Christ as the only way to heaven, that's God's path that he parted for you. And so he parted all space, all time with a pathway to heaven. And that prayer is pretty simple. It's going to God and saying, God, I confess to you, I admit, I'm, I've done wrong, a lot of wrong. But I understand today that Jesus died for me. I don't get it all, but I understand that Jesus died for me. Right now, I'm trusting in Jesus as the only way to heaven. God, will you save me? And he will. He'll give you eternal life. And these promises apply to you because you've become a child of God. You've moved from a creation of God, God's word, not mine, to a child of God. Trust in Christ. But also remember that regardless who wins, God does not rule from the Oval Office, right? And our Savior does not ride on Air Force One. He rules above the heavens and the earth. He rules over all men, and he can do whatever he wants. And so I'd like for you to take this away with you today. It's a pretty simple message. You can write it down. It's not too many words. If God can part the Red Sea, he can make a way for you and me. Walk in faith and see. If I were to summarize this story down to an application for today, it would be that. If God can part the Red Sea, he can make a way for you and me. Walk in faith and see. What are you facing? What's troubling you today? Take it to him. Trust him that he hears you, that he cares for you, Understand that he may have allowed something to come into your life because he wants to show you what he can do with it because he's the God who continually takes the difficult and then does the impossible. And when he does that in your life, your faith will skyrocket because you've seen something you've never seen before. And what will happen when that happens? You will look back to that. Patty and I have at least two instances in our lives where we were hopeless and helpless. And we look back to those very frequently and we say, if God did that, he can do this. If he did that, I know he can rescue us from this. And we go back there a lot. I would like for you to think about where has God rescued you? Once again, if God can part the Red Sea, he can make a way for you and me, walk in faith and see. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us and your love. I pray that you would work in each heart here to remind them of your love, of your goodness, of your desire to even do a miracle in our lives. But you require faith because that's what pleases you. Oh, Lord, would you have your way in my life, in our lives? We choose this day, I choose this day to walk with you, to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.